Last week, Benny walked us through a section of Solomon's opening report on life under the sun where he pursued, in particular, self-indulgence and pleasure as, as a way of finding meaning in life, as a way of finding purpose and value for all of this life. And as is the refrain in every section, it was all vanity and striving after the wind. This morning, we come to the final two subsections of this opening report that Solomon, that this preacher king has on lessons that he's learned on life under the sun. So before we get there, because it's been a lot of really bright and happy topics that we've covered so far, before we get to the bright and happy topics (laughs) that I say in sarcasm, I want to give us some of life lessons that others have shared based on their life. This is a collection of a number of different people that I can share with you if you want to hear more of their humor and their wisdom that they've learned from their time on this earth. And I'm sharing this hopefully in a way that's going to give us some light and encouragement before we charge into the valley yet again. So here's just a couple that I want to share with you that I found particularly noteworthy. If you had to identify in one word the reason why the human race has not achieved and never will achieve its full potential. That word would be meetings. There is a very fine line between hobby and mental illness. You should not confuse your career with your life. There comes a time when you should stop expecting other people to make a big deal about your birthday, and that time is age 11. (laughs) The most powerful force in the universe is gossip. The one thing that unites all human beings, regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, or ethnic background, is that deep down inside, we all believe that we are above average drivers. (laughs) You should never say anything to a woman that even remotely suggests that you think she's pregnant unless you can see an actual baby emerging from her at that moment. (laughs) Never, (laughs) I debated this next one, never under any circumstances take a sleeping pill and a laxative on the same night. (laughs) And lastly, life isn't fair, get used to it. What a list, huh? Some valuable life lessons there. I think if you were to follow most of them, you might have a better quality of life than others, although some might, you might find some argument in some of them. And while it's, they are, there's truth in what has been shared, there is no ultimate truth or ultimate lesson that is being communicated in people's life lessons. With that in mind, let's turn our attention to God's word and see what Solomon has in store for us This morning. Start with me reading in verse 12. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and a striving after wind i hated all my toil in which i toil under the sun seeing that i must leave it to the man who will come after me and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool yet he will be master of all for which i toiled and used my wisdom under the sun this also is vanity So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. 
What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. Well, church, this morning, we are going to encounter a turning point at the end, but we have to get through that valley first. We are going to reach rock bottom with Solomon in today's text. We're going to take this text in three sections, three points, if you will. We're going to take the first section on living wisely. It's called Dead and Forgotten. We're going to take verses 18 through 23, which is the trouble with toil. And then the remaining verses are going to be the difference maker this morning. So verse 12 through, six, uh, through 17, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we've covered a section on wisdom already. If this sounds familiar, this dead and forgotten section, it's because he almost says the exact same thing earlier in chapter 1. But here he's double checking something. He considered it already. This is what people do, right? This is what we all do. We start someplace. We don't find what we're looking for. So we go look over here. And then we go look over there. And then when we still haven't found what we want, what do we do? We turn back to where we started and we check it again. This is what Solomon is doing. He's looking in the most logical place where everything else has failed him. So we come back around to look at it. It's been said, and this is going to appeal to some of you, it's been said that a pessimist is an optimist with experience. <laughs> Truth. That doesn't mean that everybody's a pessimist or that you pessimist that gladly shot up and looked at me with this great smile. That's your right. A pessimist is an optimist with experience. Well, that appears to be Solomon here. Why on earth would you otherwise turn back around and look at wisdom again? You've already explored it to its depths and it has nothing for you and it's all vanity. Well, he must be an optimistic pessimist then. Now the wisdom though that he's referring to here in these verses is not the same wisdom that, 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 well it is the same wisdom we've heard about, but not the one we're going to find out about at the end of this chapter. The wisdom that he's referring to here isn't a spiritual wisdom from above as from the Lord. This is wisdom from here on earth. It's It's simply good, moral, practical advice from the here and now that you would hear from somebody like Dr. Phil or Oprah or Dear Abby or you fill in the blank. Here's some good advice that we can feel maybe warmed up by and moved forward on. And in verse 12, what we see is Solomon sharing his fatherly advice for future kings or in our case, for any human being who comes after him in life. And what he's saying, we need to pay attention to this because we're we're tempted with this far too often in our hearts because of our flesh. You're not going to find something new. You're not the exception to the standard. I know that we live in a world that tells us that we're all special and we're all unique and we all break the mold and be different. But what Solomon's telling here as he's nailing our feet to the ground, he's nailing our heart to the cross. You will find nothing new in this life. Listen to me. It's all vanity and wisdom. Stop deceiving yourself and thinking that you can be the exception to what's taking place here. However, unlike before, he actually finds that there is something different. There is something different in these few verses. You pick that up. There's something slightly different. He doesn't go, here's the issue, vanity and striving. There's actually a a break in between those two things. 
He says that there actually is more gain in living wisely than there is in living foolishly. So much so that one is like living in light and the other like living in darkness. And in verse 14, he uses an idiom, just a, 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 a true statement that they, to describe how living wisely is better than living foolishly. He says the person, the wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Just simply meaning a wise person tends to see more clearly and a fool stumbles around and has trouble navigating life. Now it's important to understand in verse 13 that the words more gain. They don't say ultimate meaning or ultimate gain or ultimate purpose. They simply say that it's a better alternative. Wisdom is a better alternative than folly or foolishness. But what we know from Psalms and Proverbs that they say the same thing, but much more forcefully, don't they? This is not just, well, wisdom is, is a better alternative. You know, right's better than left. Tall's better than short, but that's for obvious reasons. It's not wisdom is slightly better. It's a better alternative. However, the God's word would say much more forcefully that they consistently commends wisdom and condemns foolishness. Just for a moment, think about this what the Bible says about fools and foolishness. It says of the fool and of living foolishly, they hate wisdom and they hate counsel. They reject counsel. They come to ruin. They invite beatings. They live recklessly. They blabber away and they are godless. It is much better. It is not slightly better. It's not an alternative. It is much better to live wisely than it is to live foolishly. So it seems like Ecclesiastes, it seems like Solomon. If I had just taken it one verse at a time, we would say it seems like we're on the verge of this glimmer of hope, right? There's a, there's a little bit of light starting to shine through because we actually have some gain in something. Finally, maybe it's not all hopeless. Maybe there's meaning in living wisely. But there's more words in these texts that say otherwise. What is the thing that happens to all of us? Death. Death is the great equalizer. Death is no respecter of persons. Death does not care who you are or what you were or all the things that you have. Death is, comes for us all. It is undefeated and it is inevitable. So the result that Solomon says in verse 15, he asks this right question. In light of death coming for us all, why then have I been so very wise? In other words, was it all really worth it? Yes, wisdom is better, but is it really worth it in the end to be wise? Nope. Ultimately, it's all vanity. Now, for everyone listening, be hear what I'm saying and not saying. Wisdom is better. There is grace and life from God in wisdom. It is far better than foolishness. But wisdom and wise living unto itself is part of the journey. It's not the destination. And when you make it such, you lose the destination, the true destination. It's all vanity. Dead. Dead. Verse 16, for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrancing that in the days to come all have been long forgotten, dead and forgotten, dead and erased from memory. You've heard many, several of us say already, the example, no one's going to remember you. I can, I'd be willing to bet. I know it's all going to go away. We've heard pleasure's going to I'd be willing to bet all the money I have in the world on the fact that no one's going to remember my name in a hundred years. I'd love to cash it in now or put it ahead now for maybe the whatever generations are ahead so maybe they can get something. In a hundred years, at best, maybe no one will remember me and even more so will they even know that I even existed. Apart from maybe some name on some person that likes to keep a record of family tree, which are few and far between at this point in society. How many people 
are remembered across time. There are very few people that make their, part, their mark upon history of the hundreds of billions. It's this estimated hundreds of billions of people at this point in history have lived on earth. Of the hundreds of billions of people that lived on earth over time, how many are remembered? Maybe a handful. Because maybe a teacher or a historian said maybe they're worthy of being remembered because maybe they did something that was impacting. But the vast majority of us are going to die and be forgotten. There's a story from, by Alexander the Great, the great conqueror who conquered much of, of Europe and Asia, learned this lesson in a dramatic way from his friend. Alexander found his friend standing alone in a field looking intently at a large pile of bones. And when Alexander asked him what he was doing, his friend gave this reply. I am searching for the bones of your father, Philip, but I cannot seem to distinguish them from the bones of the slaves. That is the reality of our fate, dead and forgotten. Whether rich or poor, wise or foolish, Death comes for us all. Living wise has relative and temporary value, but it has no ultimate or absolute value. It can't keep you from dying, and it can't keep you from being, from being erased from memory. And Solomon's conclusion to living wisely is one we're growing very accustomed to hearing. For one brief shining moment, we thought maybe we're turning the corner. Maybe we're, we're climbing out of this valley and you're going to see this this clean over the peak and look and there's a, a ray of light nope tumbling over the other side down into the valley it is all vanity and a striving after the wind except there's something slightly different look at the look at these verses there's something slightly different about the way that he responds to vanity and striving after the wind It's one thing to find disappointment in with life, and it's one thing to find something is not fulfilling or giving meaning. It's another thing entirely to hate something. Before this, we could probably more accurately say he's been gauging his mind for truth and experience, but we really haven't seen a lot of his heart engaged. And here in this section, we see the heart of Solomon revealed in the futility of life. Not just it disappoints, not just it's not going to fulfill me, but I hate it. I hate it with everything within me. I hate life all together. All of his considering and all of his exploring and all of his searching on this subject simply left him hating life under the sun. Francois Mauriac, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1952, says this. You can't imagine the torment of having had nothing out of life and of having to look forward to nothing but death, of feeling that there is no other world beyond this one, that the puzzle will never be explained. Such is life under the sun. Because of the certainty of death and our existence being erased, oh, it is so very easy to hate life, even as Christians. I hate it, and I just want to be done with it, and I want to move on to the next one. Be done with it. Whenever we look at life under the sun, apart from God, we are led to rightly hate it. This is not just some sinful response to life under the sun. This is a right response to life under the sun. We ought to hate life, not be enamored with it. We should be dead to this life under the sun, not entertained and entwined with it. We can hate life for so many different reasons, whether it's physical pain or disease or unjust suffering or broken relationships or financial hardships or wickedness or many disappointments and life. And when we look at those things and pursue this life horizontally under the sun, that we are dead and forgotten, how can we not hate life? Unless you're a pessimist, in which this is cheerful news and confirmation for you. You'd be sitting in your seat right there. Hmm. Told you so. If you would listen to me sooner, you would not be so full of heartbreak and astonishment. 
well, I have a good news for you. His name is Jesus, so buck up. <laughs> and we're going to get there. So, dead and forgotten. Oh, life-giving. Second, the trouble with toil. Having tried wisdom and folly and pleasure and living wisdom again, living wisely again, now he turns to search out work. As he hated, li as he hated life and wisdom, he hates all of his work. According to, 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 to statistics, say that fast, the average American worker will work more than 40 hours per week and over the course of their lifetime will accumulate over 90,000 hours of work at their job. The average person will change jobs over a dozen times in their life. As a result of these numbers, studies show that people's jobs are producing more stress and an overall lower quality of life, which leads to an increased rate in depression, divorce, and substance abuse. It's reported that 50 to 85% of people, I wish I'd give you better numbers, that big wide range, it's like to me, it's saying it could be everybody or nobody. It's reported that 50 to 85% of people are unhappy and unsatisfied with their jobs. And this is data just for your job your employment or your work. None of this takes into account the work that must be done outside of your job. The work done at home, work like cleaning or laundry, cooking, driving, raising a family, building a marriage, exercising, sleeping, to name just a few. I'm exhausted thinking about all of the work. And guess what? Most of life is work, isn't it? And Solomon's short answer he said he hated it. I get this one right off the bat. I know God created us to work. My flesh hates to work. My flesh wants others to work for me. I understand Solomon's place here. Everyone in the world, every human being, everyone in this room is very acquainted with work. Whether you grew, whether growing at some point, your parents asked you, what did they ask you at one point? What do you want to be when you grow up? Or as you get a little bit older, one of the first questions that we ask somebody is what? Hi, what's your name? What do you do? What kind of work do you do? Many people expect work to give them a sense of purpose and value in life. What they, what they do is part of what makes them who they are. And according to Ecclesiastes, <laughs> tells us that work is the wrong place to look for meaning in life. Work cannot give you ultimate purpose or meaning in life under the sun. Making your work your identity, just like any other idol, will leave you empty and unfulfilled. And remember who's saying this again for just a moment. This is not just me at the end of my life having accomplished very little. This is Solomon. King Solomon, king of a country, of a people, a ruler, sovereign in this location, the ultimate of CEOs today, a builder, as we've seen, an entrepreneur, a horticulturist, an agrarian, lowercase g, God, as we saw earlier in chapter 2, who literally had it all. His work surpassed ultimately all on earth. And yet... He hated work. As we look at these verses, you, you, you can't, there are two things really that stick out to him, that bother him, that, that are the trouble with work, the trouble with toil that these verses give us. And the first is this, that one day you leave it all behind. That's the problem with work. One day you're going to leave it all behind. You can't take it with you. you. You come into this world with nothing and you'll leave it with nothing. You never see, I heard uh, Joe Leshner give this phrase one time, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. That's really what we're seeing on display here. You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. And yet, how many times are we trying to get the greatest U-Haul attached to our hearse? And yet, this reality doesn't seem to stop many of us from becoming workaholics. We work and we labor trying to get more and more and more and more for ourselves. And you could spend your whole life gathering a collection of some kind or building a business or making a home or amassing a fortune or starting a school or anything else. You fill in the blank. But guaranteed, no matter what you build and spend your life working towards, you 
can't take it with you. You're going to leave it all behind. Your business, your hard work is going to go to someone else. Your house, your dream house, or your terrible house will be sold to someone else who won't even know your name, and they won't care. Someone else will manage your portfolio. Everything you worked a lifetime for to gain, gone. Cheerfulness. Let's go work hard for the Lord. And what makes matters worse is who knows what kind of person that will be. Maybe they'll be wise and good, as, as Solomon seems to say. Or maybe they'll be a fool, which is really implied in the way that he asks and makes the statement. Regardless of whether they are wise or fool, they will be master of everything we work for. Our hope and plans are that it will go to someone we love and trust and have worked hard to position for success, whether that's a, a child or a family member or someone that we've worked side by side with that are like family. But we can never be certain who it goes to. We won't find comfort in that. Maybe it'll go to somebody good or right. With how many people there are in the world, the chances are that it's going to go to a fool. Someone who's going to waste it, squander it, not value it, not know what it took to get there and the lessons learned in it. Think about who Solomon's son was, Rehoboam. His son, in his lifetime, lost ten twelfths of his father's kingdom. One generation. One generation, one son later, all that Solomon had worked for went to a fool, his own son, who lost ten twelfths of the kingdom. You can't take it with you. You got to leave it all behind. That's the first problem with work. And the second problem with work is that it's work. It's work. It's, it's hard. It's not just that you can't take it with you or that someone else is going to get it or squander it or throw it away. It's just that it's work. No matter what your job is, it's going to wear you out. You ever looked at a picture of your parents when they were young and first got married? They look like they're 12. And then you look at them after one child and there's a, there's a slight difference or two or three are married. And then you think, wow, what happened to them? We happened to them. Life happened to them. Work happened to them. Work is wearying. Verse 23 says it's full of sorrow and vexation and restlessness and sleeplessness for all your days. Sometimes we are anxious about having work to support our families. And other times, or maybe in the next moment, we're anxious about all the work that we have to do to get done because we don't have enough time to get it all done. Day and night, night and day, no rest for the weary, and the worker is always weary. The problem with work is that it's work. Let's all go on vacation. That's the application. So I was thinking about this and be reminded of the weary work of work. I could hear two songs come to mind. It's a guy named Johnny Paycheck. That's his actual real name. Country artist from the 1970s. He had a hit song, a one-hit wonder song called Take This Job and Shove It. The refrain that he sings most often is, take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. Well, based on everyone's smiles and eyes, everyone understands that feeling. Take this job and shove it. Let me be very clear. I am not saying that related to my job, at least not right now. <laughs> Give time and maybe situations. We'll see. I'm kidding. Take this job and shove it. Or maybe another song by Loverboy called Everybody's Working for the Weekend. And let me tell you, these derailed me for at least half an hour because I love music and I got derailed by listening to these songs, which then took me on tangents to other songs, much like I am right now. Take this job and shove it, where the whole, where the whole song about everybody's working for the weekend is about working towards what? Not working. Take this job and shove it and TGIF, thank goodness it's Friday or whatever your relative Friday may be to based on your job. These are both, <laughs> these are both better responses and categories than Solomon responds with. It would be easier for us to manage and say, you know what, take this job and shove it, I'm gonna go find my fulfillment and my joy and my happiness somewhere else. Or, thank goodness it's Friday, I just gotta get through today and make it to what I don't have to do this again. 
Solomon, though, is in anguish. He hates life and work. He's despairing and vexed. He's not sleeping. He's restless. He's despairing. Because wisdom, folly, pleasure, and now work are all vanity and a striving after the wind. Nothing under the sun has meaning or purpose or identity for him. And I get this. I know what it's like to experience the problem of work, to be burdened and anxious and weighed down, to be restless and sleepless, to be weary and anxious, to feel like a failure, to work hard and move on and someone else get the fruits of my labor. I know what it's like. Oh, I know what it's like to tolerate work so that I can get to the weekend enjoyment. And I know what it's like to hate my job that I go to every day. Not this one. That'd be a really encouraging thing to share, wouldn't it, right now? But God has met me in my despair. No. You know why this is such a problem for, for, for me? You know why it's such a problem for, for Solomon? You know why it's such a problem for all of us? Because we have an innate longing to matter. We have a deep-seated desire to do something or be something or make something that will last and have an impact on others. We, we want to have meaning and value and purpose and identity. We want to make a difference. A question, though, is that we're all going to ask ourselves or that we evaluate regularly is what kind of difference have I made? This question can haunt us all of our days on earth. What do I have to show for my work? What do I have to show for my life? Our greatest fear is that we won't matter or have no meaning or leave no legacy that will be dead and forgotten. And here's Solomon wisely telling us that wisdom and folly will be no help to you. There isn't enough stuff and pleasure in the world to help you find true joy or happiness. All your hard work will be left behind and go to someone else. And on top of that, all your work will be hard and wearying. That in this life, you'll be gone and erased from memory, leaving no legacy. Life under the sun is broken. It doesn't add up. It's despairing. It's hated. It's restless and weary. Where Solomon is at right now has been a process. He's considered all of life and experienced all that it has to offer. His conclusion is that it has nothing for him. And it's this bottoming out, this process has been God designed and ordained. Because now positioned at the bottom, bottomed out, rock bottom, he can begin to consider other true realities above the sun. Where God has been acknowledged so far, or at least a head nod so far in these verses, now God actually enters the picture in verse 24. He starts now to consider the realities and truths of God. Instead of just considering maybe God's aware, here we are not prepared for what can happen next at rock bottom bottom. And so lastly, we come to the difference maker. Verse 24 and 25, it says, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God for apart from him who can eat or who can have enjoyment. Michael Eaton writes, having experienced the bankruptcy of our pretended autonomy, the preacher now points to the God who occupies the heavenly realm and to the life of faith in him. Our pretended autonomy. I think it's a perfect three-word summary of the first two chapters of Ecclesiastes. I think it's a perfect summary of, of life under the sun for every human being. Our pretended autonomy. It's an empty, bankrupt fantasy. A life lived out as if it's a dream. It's the kindness of God to allow Solomon to feel this emptiness because it's that emptiness that is now driving him to God. It's causing him to lift his eyes above the sun to the heavenly realm. Solomon's seen that life under the sun has no meaning or purpose or joy and now begins to wrestle with the reality of true joy, with the reality of, of life from the hand of God. True joy can be had. It is there. 
but only by the hand of God. By the hand of God, and it is entirely a gift. The difference maker in life under the sun is the maker of all life, God himself. Everything in life is a gracious gift from God. The big things and the small daily things, things like food and drink on your table, wisdom and knowledge for daily living, our jobs, all are gifts from God to us intended to draw our attention and gaze back to God in humble, joy-filled worship. Solomon had everything that life offers and yet he had nothing. Do you know why? Because he tried to enjoy and take all of God's gifts without ever turning and considering the giver of those gifts. He supposed that all of this was for him. He assumed, and we all regularly attempt to believe this with him, that we actually deserve God's gifts. The reality is that none of us actually deserve God's gifts. We don't deserve the gifts we have in this life. We aren't deserving of his gifts. We aren't worthy of his love. We don't qualify for mercy. We have no talents or abilities that God has need of. We are spiritually bankrupt sinners left to ourselves. As a matter of fact, the only thing that we do deserve is hell. Which makes what God, which makes what God has done in saving us and loving us and forgiving us through Christ astonishing and unexplainable. Seeing the brokenness, the emptiness of this life and who we are represented in that life. And then Christ's love for us, God, what he did for us should leave us without being able to speak like I am right now. There's just not words to be able to communicate. I don't understand this. There's no reason, there's no concept, there's no way for me to grasp why other than he chose to. Everything outside of hell, think about this, because this needs to shape the way we do everyday life. Everything outside of hell is a gracious, loving goodness from God. It's all an expression of God's goodness to us. Everything outside of hell. I know that confronts us because that confronts me. I'm tempted to think of many things that aren't good. They're, they're inconvenient. They're tiring or wearying. They're all good gifts from God. And the difference in all of life is God himself. No one can find true joy or meaning or purpose apart from him. Instead of making the journey the destination, instead of looking for meaning, identity, and worth in other things, instead of making himself the center of all things, Solomon sees now God and his presence as the destination. Looks to him alone for meaning and worth. Makes him the center of all things. And when God is that, then everything is now seen for what it truly is. A gracious gift from God. And the response is enjoyment in the things that he gives for everyday life. In the remaining verses, verse 25, verse 26, he makes a distinction between two kinds of people, those under the favor of God and those who are lost in their sins. Some see this as a works righteousness, you know, good things happen to good bad people, bad things happen to bad people. It's not. It's a careful distinction between people who live under the goodness and mercy and sovereignty of God and those who persist in their sins. That's what we see here. What this verse is not saying is a prosperity gospel either. Christians aren't going to get the spoils and riches of this life by believing in and following God. And that sinners are going to lose all their possessions. What's described is a people who receive the spiritual blessings of God. And now for the first time in Ecclesiastes, the wisdom referred here in this section of the book is the wisdom that is from above. A divine gift of wisdom. God's good, gracious wisdom. There is nothing that produces more vexation and despair and anger and weariness and restlessness than sin, which is also mentioned here for the first time in these verses. Sin is what defines life under the sun apart from God, which is why it's vanity, which is why it's striving after the wind, which is why it has all of the effects that we see in Solomon and in us. This is how every human, li human lives life apart from God. But when God broke into our hearts, 
and into our minds and into our souls because of Christ, because of what he did in living and dying and rising again for us, because of his gracious gifts of salvation and forgiveness and atonement and justification, to name just a few. Because of God, we are saved and can now experience joy in life. Not only can we enjoy food, not only can we enjoy drink, but we can enjoy work. How does this work though? How can we find joy in work when we just heard about how burdensome and despairing it is? So is work, is, is the problem with work, is that is it really a curse or is it really a blessing? Which, which one is it? That you can't be both. Well, to quote Charles Dickens, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It is both. Scripture tells us that it's both. There's a tension that, that resides here for Christians. That work is both a curse and work is both a blessing. We can work in a hard and difficult and seemingly intolerable job with joy because of God. We can be at peace and trust God when work isn't there or when there is so much that it's overwhelming. And what we're seeing in these three verses, 24 through 26, is a functional belief in the sovereignty of God. God is in charge of it all. There is nothing outside of his control. All of it is for his glory and our good. All of it is a good, gracious gift from him for us that is intended to lead us into worship of him, not to find fulfillment and enjoyment here and now. And it's a life of faith that navigates this tension between hard and wearying and joy-filled work. And the good news, brothers and sisters, when we talk about work, is that the work needed most in this world has already been done, and it's been done by Christ alone. Think about that for a moment next time you're tempted to, to, to feel the weight of work, the overwhelming hardship, the weary and restlessness. You know true joy. You know true peace. You know true life because of the finished work of Christ, which puts in perspective the hard, wearying work you do each and every day, which tells you, reminds you of, of the one who walked before you and is familiar with our griefs, who's familiar with our sorrows and our trials and our troubles, who himself knows and has been there and can administer grace and joy and strength from his own hand, an unlimited supply of spiritual blessings. The finished work of Christ shapes our work of life in all things. And it's the work of God that we should be primarily concerned with. It doesn't mean that we just all quit our jobs and start a commune and go be missionaries. For some, that might be the case to be missionaries full time. For all of us, it's his it's being joined into the work of God that we are called to, to primarily give attention to. It means that in whatever work we do, at whatever table we find ourselves eating and drinking, even if you're someplace eating somebody's food and drink that you don't particularly like, or whatever labor we, and energy we put into our work, we do it all, what? For the glory of God. That he may be seen and heard and known as the one and only true saving God. How can we do this practically? I'm going to give you two very brief, and I'm going to invite the band to come, two very brief applications to this for daily life. First, find our ultimate enjoyment in God for all things, especially the daily things in life. Be satisfied in him alone. See his abundant goodness all around you. Make him the center of your life and your day and your work. He ought to be the short-term and long-term goals for your life. Cultivate joy and gratitude and gratefulness. Thank him for the gifts at every opportunity. Remind yourself you're not worthy or deserving of these gifts. And then be all the more amazed at his love for you. Cultivate daily habits of grace. Read your Bible, pray, fellowship, build one another up. See your life here on earth, as, as Benny shared last week, as a sojourning on earth. Headed in a heavenly destination and direction and then live like it by the grace of God. 
find joy at the hand of God for all the daily things in life like folding laundry and doing the dishes and taking out the trash and filling out forms and changing diapers and participating in meetings and persevering in your job and being patient with your spouse and suffering to the physical body that God has given you but with a heart spilling over in gratefulness because God has loved you and is sovereignly working in you and has designed it all for your good and his glory. Be distinctly a heavenly citizen and not some mashup of this world and Christ. To find your ultimate enjoyment in God for all things, and especially the daily things. And second, leave a gospel legacy. We all want to matter. We all want to make a difference. We all want to have an impact on those around us. We want to be difference makers. Life under the sun, as we heard, is meaningless and empty and we will be gone and forgotten but life under the son of god is true enjoyment and meaning and purpose so let us work at leaving a legacy of gospel work not so that people remember us but people will remember him so they will be called to him that they will see him they will encounter the goodness of god in through christ alone so let us labor in christ by the power of the spirit to share the good news of salvation through Christ alone. Let us not be concerned with our legacy or our reputation or our image or our anything. But let us be concerned with the legacy of Jesus Christ. That others may know him and then be able to proclaim them themselves. Amen? Amen. 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 Spirit of God, I pray. I pray that this would be reality in our midst, that we would find true enjoyment in you alone, that we'd find true life and meaning in you alone, that you'd guard us from temptation. Lord, encourage where needs, encouragement is needed. Exhort where exhortation is needed. Convict where conviction is needed. Let us see the goodness of God in all things and let our desire to leave a lasting impact, to leave a legacy would be for you and not for ourselves. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.